Greetings, my name is Roberto Valdez, Master of the Science of Geography and Instructor of History at Northern New Mexico College in Española, New Mexico. The arrival of Paleolithic humans to the American Southwest El Norte Mexicano, as it is also known, progressed in response to climate changes to a set of eras known as the Basket Maker Eras. This happened around 7000 BC. They are so named after the people's use of plant fibers to make their household goods and articles of clothing. There's early basket maker, uh, basket maker two, and basket maker three eras, with the first era often being called the archaic period. So let's have a look at our learning objectives today. And that's the descendants of Paleolithic migrants to the Americas had to adapt their culture to changing climate. Climate change has been typical for humans as part of life on Earth for a very long time. The people of the Archaic Era appear in the archaeological record in the American Southwest, El Norte Mexicano, as a people who hunt smaller game than their forebears, the Paleolithic people like Clovis Man. You'll hear um, in this lecture how wild foods and famine foods of our subregion in New Mexico fed the early people of the Southwest, El Norte region. I want you to know how the domestication of plants such as corn, beans, and squash, and other foodstuffs improved the lives of the hunter-gatherers. I want you to know that the hunter-gatherers of the Southwest El Norte region underwent cultural adaptation, uh, evolving with identifiable changes that archaeologists identify and group into these time periods known as the Cochise culture to the south of us in southern New Mexico and southern Arizona, and as a Basket Maker 2 and Basket Maker 3 eras here in the north. I want you to be able to describe what made these eras distinctive in time and in culture. So notice this map, um, which is hinting at what you will see later in this presentation. This is the ancient maize map, where corn, also known as maize, shows up as part of the artifacts of these archaeological sites in the southwest El Norte. So let's talk about the climate. There's a change from the prior era. Not only have the glaciers melted and retreated far to the north, and not only has it stopped raining so heavily in the Paleo Lakes, uh, they begin to shrink, there's also a change to drier conditions. Areas of desert begin to grow, and forests that require more moisture begin a slow retreat up the mountains. People at this time are using plant fibers in addition to animal skins, and they're relying generally more and more upon vegetation for their survival. Leaves, uh, roots, berries, nuts, fungi, and the seeds of grasses are collected and processed. The giant hairy creatures, the megafauna, are gone. As the climate warms up, the formerly giant creatures don't do as well as their smaller counterparts. So by about 6,000 BC, two-thirds of all North American animals weighing more than 100 pounds become extinct. Hunters hunt small game while continuing to hunt their largest creature available, the bison antiquus. Many scholars think that it was not only climate change to a warmer and drier climate, but also an increasing population that hurried the extinction of the megafauna and reduced the variety of prey. You have to remember that the hunting technique of this time was to get large creatures to get stuck in the mud of marshes, or you trapped them in ravines, or you drove them over cliffs. So the less glorious way of obtaining uh, food was to scavenge the kill of predatory animals. And uh, by teaming up and scaring off bears, for example, or lions, you could grab some bones of that freshly killed carcass and then break them open and remove this white substance from inside called marrow for some quick nutrition. Uh, but less gross sounding is the gathering of nuts, fruits, and anything else in season. Living in caves or brush shelters, groups of people moved from place to place according to the season or when they felt that they depleted the numbers of uh, game birds or game animals too much in their region. So the climate was getting drier. Uh, they, they also took advantage of opportunities to follow these migratory animals, such as bison, or, or gather fruits and nuts that were in season according to the region. 
When these uh, nomadic people arrived in an area of wild nuts or seeds, they'd use exposed bedrock to grind them. And you'll recall from a prior lesson the atlat, atlat, which is a lever tool device to chuck a spear with greater velocity. That continued to be used during this time. But in south central Mexico, nomadic hunter gatherers were conducting the first experiments to domesticate a wild grass called teosinte. Teosinte, which is what we know uh, it would evolve into corn or maize. Corn or um, also known as maize. Maize, maize, maize are all the same word. But in English, you'll often hear me in this program call it maize. At this time, there's a continued reliance on what they call famine foods. And let me show you what that is next. So, what's a famine food? It's a food eaten when dry conditions prevented or damaged domestic crops. Or when your prefer preferred food is not available due to the season or climactic conditions that caused game to become scarce. Uh, it is foods that people relied upon because it was from more widely available vegetation that required more processing because it was bad tasting or even toxic. Some of these foods had defenses like thorns or uh, had such low yields of seeds that you just have to work too hard and a long time to get anything to eat. But in times of need, they would take the time. Um, now, this is on one condition. They had to be edible even if they had to go for some processing first. If you're curious after this lecture uh, about this kind of information, you can go and look up Paul E. Minnis, depicted here in the illustration, uh, for further information concerning this topic. The uh, map shows the tribes, the distribution of Indian tribes in the southwest El Norte, but uh, at this time, of course, you have to remember that we're talking about a prior era before these people uh, who identify themselves by these names existed. I don't mean to characterize all famine foods as bad tasting, undesirable, or, or, or difficult to get at. Some are delicious. Uh, during the early spring, soil moisture in the, in the soil is at its highest after the, the snows melt. In the lowland arid areas, such as the, this particular photograph at lower right, which is called the Llano de Huachupangue, west of Española, uh, this is a place that can yield, in the early spring, some, uh, some wild herbs, and I'll show you. The seasonal herbs that I've included here, are, such as in the upper photograph, upper right, is called Chimaha. Chimaha. It's a kind of wild parsley. And then there's this wild onion called Cebolleta. Uh, which is on the, pictured at the lower left. You can barely make it out. I know that's the best photograph I could get of it. A cebollota is a little tiny onion. You pull it out of the ground or dig it out of the ground and it has this cute little bulb. Next, I'd like to show you some uh, examples of uh, <clears throat> grasses that yield seeds that are good to eat, um, although the yield is very low. And uh, this includes the common reed grass shown at the right and the Indian rice grass shown below. The Indian rice grass grows in sandy areas and I can testify that it yields these little tiny black seeds uh, in the month of May that can be carefully gleaned from the grassy seed heads, piled into the cup of your palm, and then popped into the mouth. Now, let's have a look at the milling sites used to, the, to process the seeds and nuts. People could use these large rocks, boulders, or bedrock and take advantage of irregularities on them to grind the seeds, nuts, dried fruit, or dried meat. It was common to find the produce of the land and then process them near where you were collecting them or, or at campsites. Using a handheld stone pedestal, uh, which is a, just a rock in the hand, you could use it in the hole or trough of the bedrock. Now let me take my pen and show you one of the troughs right here. Like I saw this one right here that's kind of nice. All these other ones here, here, here. It was winter time when I took this photograph. And they, those all have um, water in them from melting snow. So you would use this hand stone pedestal, pedestal in a hole or trough in the bedrock. A trough. 
and this was called a milling basin. So things like acorns could be cracked open, uh, uh, then dried out or somewhat dried out, and then ground into a powder that was later washed free of its bitter-tasting uh, tannic acid, and it could be <clears throat> made edible. Uh, milling slick or polished surfaces develop on the rock with every use, and sometimes the same places were used over and over, over generations. So archaeologists, when they go into the field and they look for these places like this, they see what they call milling slick on bedrock, and they know, ah, this is an, uh, probably uh, an early um, seed gathering and milling site for the archaic people or people that lived thereafter, because they were doing it way later in time as well. So uh, let me show you a, a selection of useful trees. This one is called the One Seed Juniper. And it yields a little tiny blue-purple berry that wild birds consume. And they defecate them, helping to spread the seed. It is a strong, pungent sort of uh, tree sap taste. The berries were generally eaten by the young uh, people, that is, but made more palatable by roasting them first. And then they could use them also as a hot remedy if, for people who had illnesses such as internal chills. Indians used the, the twigs and berries in courtship. You know, young men to impress the ladies. They would put them on the, in their hair. They were worn a, a part of, as part of a costume in a dance ceremony or such. Other than its obvious use as a fuel wood for our winters, people have burned the scale-like leaves into ashes and those are mixed into a batter of corn flour for some recipes. You can peel the bark and make uh, these uh, useful fibers called in the local dialect of New Mexico Spanish, cuipas, cuipas. You can use this fibrous bark as a tinder for fires. You can chink walls and roofs uh, um, uh, along with uh, uh, the mud, for example. You can bind it with yaca twine into sticks to make torches useful to carry light from uh, from house to house in a pueblo. The um, people who would also use the wood um, and using talk, uh, uh, yaka twine for a bowstring, they could make a bow out of this uh, type of wood uh, for ceremonies. You can boil the leaves uh, for a medicinal bath, like for women three days after childbirth, or they uh, drank it as, as a tea four days after childbirth. You can make an incense with it by placing the leaves in a pot with uh, hot coals, and then it would give off a sweet aroma. You can also uh, uh, toast the, uh, the, uh, the, the leaves um, with embers and then bind it with using a wrap to injuries uh, to reduce swelling. The resin, which is the, the sticky stuff that comes out of some of the trees, especially at an injury, uh, could be chewed as a gum, or you could use it as a temporary filling for des dental cavities. And um, if you carefully peel back the bark and scrape this moist white skin, you can use that and eat it as a famine food. We call this in New Mexico Spanish, pino piñon, or piñon pine. It is most famous for its nut, which is harvested in around um, October, November, and not every forest uh, in a given region will produce piñon nuts every year. Uh, the resin from this piñon tree called trementina in Spanish, or the sticky stuff, you recall, it's very useful stuff. Trementina was used to mend cracked water jars. Uh, you could draw out uh, cactus spines that you stuck in your, in your hand uh, and you, to draw them out. Uh, pull them out easier. Got to consider this is the era before metal tweezers available at your local pharmacy. And uh, you, you can also use it to keep uh, air out of cuts and sores and uh, cavities in the teeth. You can mend it, uh, or I'm sorry, well, use it for mending uh, two uh, types of uh, fiber fabric together. You can melt it or make it soft by heating it up for one thing. And the Indians would use it on a bowl-shaped wicker basket called jicaritas or little fiber pots, and make them into the watertight canteens. Of course, there's the obvious use of these trees as a fuel wood to keep warm in our winters. It's not really good as a building material, but sometimes you can uh, find a useful trunk for a fence post. And certainly, uh, for people camping out, they use the uh, branches to make shelters. 
So now let me uh, introduce you to the Encino, the scrub oak, which we know in Spanish as Encino. Now, uh, its acorns are called bayotas in Spanish, and they are useful to eat, but only after processing them like I covered in a previous frame about the milling sites. It's good for fuel wood when it's dried out after several months, and if you can find a straight piece, you can use it as a handle for farm tools. Indians used to use the wood for uh, digging sticks, war clubs, and for uh, this, uh, I'll show you right here, the rabbit stick. You see that? Let me outline it for you with my highlighter pen. Right there, isn't that fascinating? And you thought boomerangs were just found in Australia. So um, this is called a rabbit stick, and, and it looks like a kind of boomerang, but it does it's the kind that doesn't return to you. You fling it with a wrist action at a rabbit, and you kill it with blunt force. Next, I want to introduce you to bear grass. Bear grass is a type of plant with fibrous leaves that can be woven into a variety of household uses. The leaves can be dried and then split into these four or five strands that are of good size uh, before using them. Bear grass can be found in uh, arid mountainsides in the states of Arizona, southern New Mexico, and northern Sonora and Chihuahua, Mexico. Uh, people known as the Pima and their rivals the Papago of Arizona who call themselves the Tohono O'odham. They uh, would use it to weave baskets as do the people of uh, Jemez, New Mexico and the southern Rio Grande Pueblos like Isleta. In Isleta Pueblo, New Mexico, uh, bear grass seeds were ground into a meal for food and their roots uh, can be boiled and used to treat uh, rheumatism and uh, pneumonia. It's not just uh, bear grass that was useful for its fiber. Here in the north central state of New Mexico, we have another notable and shall I say symbolic plant, symbolic of the southwest, that is often uh, used uh, for soap, the roots are. Um, it's called the yucca, but it's also called palmia, palmia in the New Mexico Spanish language. Uh, twisted fibers can be used to make rope, but you have to go through this process of boiling or roasting them and then beating out the flesh. And the same goes with uh, um, agave, another plant called agave. It would take an Indian community um, to work to get the leaves of the yaca or palmia and then process them to separate the fibers to make things such as fishing nets uh, for the rivers. Uh, in one story that I heard, an entire village would dedicate time to do this. They would put all, many members of the tribe to chew the, the fibers and, uh, and to separate the flesh from the fibers. Uh, and then with the fibers they could then spin them into twine and then twine into the fishing nets. Now other uses by the American Indians include sandals such as shown at lower uh, left here and potholders, uh, potholders for balancing a water jar on the head. They're circular and they go on the top of the scalp to support a, uh, a water pot. Now, I would like for you to learn the name of one of the more important people named by archaeologists. Um, it's a cultural group that lived in the southwest El Norte during the Archaic period time. Earlier, I introduced you to the uh, Archaic area that or era, I'm sorry, that stretched from 7000 BC to 1500 BC. And it's also known as the early basket maker era. The Cochise tradition, um, however, occupied an obscure time from before 5000 BC to 2000 BC in what is today's southern New Mexico and southern Arizona. The Cochise people who lived in the Mogollon Mountains and the Mogollon Rim area were starting to settle down a lot more, but they moved around with the seasons. And they're named after a lake. So in order to, so that there's not too much confusion about what I'm talking about, here's the uh, area of the southwest that I'm going to zoom in on. Notice it's New Mexico and Arizona, there's part of California, all these different states that didn't exist at this time. So this is a broad region of a climate in which these people wandered about in. Uh, remember, I want you to learn to despatialize. Here's the Mogollon Rim, 
outlined here. You'll notice this chain of mountains, and I will outline it in uh, my, well, let me get my uh, red pen so that you can see it, stretching from here, like this, Mogollon Rim, into the headwaters of the Rio Gila, or Gila River. Um, the Mogollon, the Sierra del Mogollon here, there's different names for these different chains of mountains all throughout this region. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to call this, uh, I'll sometimes refer to it as the Mogollon Rim, but also the Mogollon Highlands. So this area is uh, significant because it's the habitation of the Cochise people. Let me uh, grab my eraser and uh, erase that. And I'm going to uh, zoom in to a place that I want you to see. It's called Wilcox Playa. It's right in here. See that? It's east of Tucson. It's west of the border with New Mexico. As I zoom in, you will get a better idea of what it looks like. It's a large alkali flat, a mud flat. This was once a lake. And it, uh, here's a little uh, uh, railroad siding stop of Cochise. So it's south of Wilcox, Arizona. Now, I want you to also pay attention to some other uh, significant uh, places in this region. As I move eastward, we're going to go to this place right here. This is inside New Mexico. Notice that I'm here at what they call the boot heel of the state of New Mexico. And as I zoom in, you're going to see Lordsburg. And so this is called the Playa uh, de Animas. Playa de Animas. It was once a large lake that has since dried up. And as I zoom in, you can see that it, there's a highway that passes right through it. Uh, the interstate. Uh, and it connects uh, Las Cruces with Tucson, Arizona. And it crosses this large, broad, flat lake bed. Which still fills up with puddles of water during torrential downpours. Now let's move upward so that I can show you something else. Here's Albuquerque, or Albuquerque, and about 125 miles south and west of Albuquerque, in the central western part of the state, north of the Sierra de Gila, is this large flat area right in here. This is called the Llano de San Agustin. Llano de San Agustin. You'll recall from the prior lesson, the Llano de San Agustin, which features here the uh, dry lake bed with a lot of alkali, another one here, and someone somewhat over here in this location. Notice here's the little towns of Datil and Magdalena. And I'm going to zoom in to this part of the, uh, the plains. They're called also the plains of San Agustin, the Llano de San Agustin. And as I zoom in, notice this peculiar uh, array. It's called the Very Large Array. It is a set of radio telescopes that are uh, built uh, with wheels that roll on these railroad tracks. And they're all clustered in kind of tight right now for this photograph. Here's the, uh, the main facility, the repair facility, the visitor center, and so forth. But this place is uh, quite extraordinary because they're, doing, uh, uh, they're aimed at, the, at space in order to uh, hear sound waves that uh, various objects in the universe uh, give off. And uh, the tracks run for miles in three directions. And so, like for example, in this direction you have a train track running for quite a, a number of miles. I can call out my measuring tool here, click here, uh, and click here. Let's see. 12 miles is one uh, arm of this uh, very large array. And they selected this place because it's very flat. So let's move to the west uh, here. And I'm going to zoom in with my tools here on over. I'm going to zoom into a peculiar part of this that where I want you to see the, uh, the, the dry lake bed and what it looks this way. I'm going to turn. I'm turning now to the south so you can see just how broad and uh, peculiar the surface is. It does have some grass, but it's also very cracked because it shows evidence of having once been a dry lake bed. And then this area right in here is where uh, a site was called Bat Cave. Bat Cave. 
and this bat cave held some very peculiar artifacts that we're going to look at next. So members of the Cochise culture uh, living in the, that broad basin in the west central state of New Mexico known as the Llano de San Agustin, uh, that was a shrinking paleo lake, um, were, were discovered in this place known as Bat Cave, which was excavated during the years of 1948 to 1950. Scientists were just developing this thing they call radiocarbon dating, which is a method of testing the age of, uh, of any kind of dead organic matter for the slight amount of radioactive carbon that it has that wastes away over time at a measured amount. This includes the fragments of baskets, sandals, and remnants of early domesticated crops, as well as wild seeds and nuts that this ancient people gathered into their cave for storage. They found a goodly amount of bones and uh, of animals that they hunted around the area and that they ate and that you see listed here as well as stone tools and arrowheads. They also found parts of uh, atlat spear throwers as well as uh, bow tips and uh, cigarettes and smoking pipes. Let's have a look at some of these items. So here we see three articles woven out of fiber made of yaca or palmilla and on the left is a coiled uh, flat basket made by starting in the center point and then weaving the fibers around in a circle to the edges to the satisfaction of the maker. The two others are twilled bottle shaped bags and the one at the right or center uh, or I'm sorry the one at the yeah extreme right is still has some fiber it's peeking out of it and it is believed that it was uh, used not only to store the extra fiber that they were getting from the yucca but also to do repairs. Uh, is it also served as a spinning whirl so you would uh, uh, it was like a spindle you draw out some of the fibers and you twist them uh, spinning the bag around and around so you drew them out to make thread twine or things like what you, uh, you are about to see in the next frame so here we have a set of sandals uh, left behind in the cave from those ancient times. To the left, you can see that the finest of the collection that I've selected here for you to see is made of very finely woven yaca or palmilla fiber. Uh, and also, there is also a larger plant growing in the mountains called amole or wide bladed yaca. The examples to the right are thicker and uh, clearly easier to make. But notice that the one in the, uh, in roughly the large one in the middle uh, is, uh, it's the third from the right, still has some tying straps that tied around the foot. Among the finds was this fantastic example of early corn or maize. Seeds had clearly been traded north from its origin from, uh, in south central Mexico by this time. The latest dating method assigned it a time to around uh, 2430 to 1130 BC as a reasonable period for the earliest farming in the region. Now shown at left is two examples of a primitive pod popcorn measuring uh, about four to four and a half inches long. This is a kind of corn older than a corn that would appear in, later in Mexico called chapalote. Uh, chapalote is a long season corn. Here in the north, of course, the growing season is shorter. Shown at right is the corn cob, or um, with its husk still intact. It had four leaves, uh, and and the thing is, it this particular corn cob uh, with husk did not show signs that it fully covered its cob. I should point out that the individual kernels of corn seeds on the photo to the left. Uh, in the pod popcorn were enveloped individually on the cob by these little pod leaves uh, in this primitive pod popcorn. So where did uh, maize or corn come from? You heard me mention earlier it's south central Mexico. Specifically uh, maize is derived from a wild grass called teosinte growing in the central Balsas River Valley of southern Mexico that scientists have called the hearth of maize. Uh, it's estimated that domestication may have occurred sometime after 9,000 years ago because they found an archaeological site that had stone tools with the residue of early maize 
in the layer of deposits that were dated to 8,700 years ago. The inhabitants of south-central Mexico deliberately planted seeds of teosinte that had the characteristics they most appreciated. Maybe it was size, maybe it was even taste. But over time, this process called selective breeding, where you deliberately hold back the seeds with unwanted characteristics and save and plant the ones you do like, over generations of time, somewhat in these isolated gardens to keep them from uh, breeding or, or uh, cross-pollinating back with the wild relative. And you create this new food form. But it's directly related to its natural or native relative. As a consequence, humans and corn develop this symbiotic relationship of dependence on each other. Because domestic corn cannot effectively reproduce unless people deliberately plant the, the granules. So, <clears throat> with the progress of time, hunter-gatherers in the region of the southwest El Norte continued their experimentation with domestic plants as well as uh, wild plants. Uh, we move on to this era spanning a time with uh, ranging from about 1500 BC to AD 50. Shown in this photograph is a diorama or model of miniatures depicting uh, life in a rock shelter by nomadic people doing things like scraping hides, uh, drying meat, weaving baskets, and building small shelters dug into the ground. Just so in case you're like, well, I'm moving too fast. Here's the meat. Here's the hide. Here's the, uh, they're building some kind of a structure of sticks. I don't know what. This fella is testing out an atlat. A child is admiring the adult doing so. Um, you have a uh, uh, people with baskets, women with baskets here and here. This one is grinding corn. Uh, this one is working on some kind of project, maybe uh, doing some sewing. Uh, here's two fellows that are digging little pits in the ground. And let's give you some more detail on that right now. Here I've taken the liberty of zooming in so you can see that these people would dig pits and line them with flat rocks. Of course, they still continue to build shelters of poles, branches, and leafy vegetation or grass. Before you are led to think that everything um, uh, they did was permanent, I should not lead you astray and tell you that, yeah, they did move around seasonally. Um, one of the typical kind of movements was to go up to the mountains in the summers and then down to the lowlands in the winters. So they continued their reliance on famine foods, they practiced other things uh, they received from the many generations prior to them, like planting maize and hunting with the atlat. At this time, uh, they also employed a technique of basket making. Diagrammed <clears throat> to the right of your frame by those uh, funny black dots and speckled dot that I've included here. Now just imagine this as a side view of what you're seeing in the photograph, which is a uh, spiral twill technique. Shown at the upper left is an illustration uh, that divides it in, it's divided into two parts and what it's intended to show is that we can see two strong rods of willow bound, out, bound up with a bundle of a grass, it's a kind of grass rod or just a bundle, uh, elongated bundle of grass and all three are bound together by this fiber lacing. So remember this, it's called the two rod and bundle basket and it uses the spiral twill technique two rod and bundle basket using the spiral twill technique so next let's uh, revisit uh, maize for a moment again it's also known as corn which is not a perfect name for it in Latin American Spanish it's maize or in New Mexico Spanish it's maize I'm sorry mice and, uh, and in English, it's maize. This developed in south-central Mexico about 9,000 years ago and was cultivated in New Mexico since about 2,860 B.C. When Cochise people in the Mogollon Rim uh, region of Arizona and New Mexico cultivated maize, we're starting to see them settle down more and more. Now, their rivals to the north... The early basket maker people uh, started to settle down later. The people of the Colorado Plateau began to uh, cultivate maize 
around 500 BC. Now that's the Four Corners area that we know of today. Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico all meet in a common Four Corners area uh, that is straddling or layered on top of the Colorado Plateau. Now, um, it wasn't until about a thousand years later in that region that they grew dependent upon maize. In the photograph below are two cobs from Mesa Verde in the state of Colorado um, it, at one of the museums on, on, at Mesa Verde. The examples here are, are, they're about 700 years old, but notice that they are smaller and they have a, this brownish wood stain color. Isn't that unusual? At, that, um, at a, another museum on the Mesa Verde, I took this photograph at lower left, which um, uh, you got to visit the place if you've occasion to, to have a chance because it's rich in archaeological sites uh, and, and uh, just in general, uh, the Four Corners region, the, uh, the whole area is rich in archaeological sites. But this one in the state of Colorado, this museum has a collection of 700-year-old remnants of agricultural products. And I'm using them here to talk about a much later, or much earlier time period. This one is only 700 years ago. We're talking about 2000 BC. So in New Mexico, um, uh, we call we call pumpkins calabaza in Spanish, and calabacita can mean summer squash, which is squashes with a soft skin that are harvested when they are immature, or it can mean winter squash that uh, forms all this hard skin suitable for storage uh, over the winter because uh, um, if they are soft skin and immature they rot sooner pumpkins start out as small and soft in the summer as an immature vegetable and if they are yanked from the vine while green to be cut up and fried they are considered calabacitas as well so once fully grown the pumpkin can be kept for a while but they need to be either eaten or cut into these uh, strips we call tasajos and dried on a clothesline so that they don't get moldy. Winter squashes like the one in the picture at lower left have delicious flesh that can be roasted and eaten immediately or kept over the winter because they have this protective shell which is here preserved after 700 years. Pumpkins or calabaza have one advantage over squash and that's that they give these nice big seeds that can be roasted cracked open and then eaten. All this variety of uh, curcurbita is the scientific name derived from wild, wild relatives that were domesticated in Mexico perhaps around 6700 BC. These tiny little little squashes, wild squashes, are now these huge pumpkins that you can carry with both arms. So they arrived around uh, uh, 1680 BC to New Mexico and they're found today in many places of the world now thanks to their distribution by European explorers that visited the Americas and then took some back. So let's discuss where beans came from. Originating in south central Mexico at around the 7th millennium BC. They were domesticated from a wild plant with these itty bitty beans uh, according to geneticists who took samples from Mexico. We call them frijoles in Spanish, and they appear in the archaeological record around 500 BC in New Mexico. So, Bat Cave in the Mogollon Highlands yielded a possible arrival date as early as 1260 BC. But generally, within a few hundred years BC, the cultivation of a, what they call Faiseolas vulgaris, or the common bean, takes off in New Mexico. In uh, the photograph below, we see some 700-year-old bean vines. Yes, they are. They're from. They're well preserved because they were found in cliff dwellings high up on cliffs, and stored away by the or, uh, original people. And then, uh, when the place was abandoned, they left behind in these uh, storage cribs uh, their their vegetable produce. Believe it or not. So, and the, notice to the right, there's this bowl of beans. It's a kidney type of bean. The beans that I've included in the photograph to the extreme left are frijol de bolita, and that is the traditional New Mexico Hispano, uh, Hispano variety of, of, uh, of bean that was grown here in New Mexico much later on. 
So now let's move on to um, to to how these people are evolving. Um, the late basket maker two era lasted from about the year fifty forward to the year A.D. five hundred. It's a time period applied by archaeologists to mark uh, a change in the basket maker's way of life, in which they did pretty everything pretty much the same, but they lived in bigger houses and they grew more interested in farming and they innovated pottery. So the bigger houses that I'm uh, talking about are the shallow pit houses that are larger than before, but with a permanent character with a with a fire pit in the center, and, and they're mm, all, not quite halfway underground, but but part of them is in this shallow pit that is dug. The people started living in clusters of them uh, by reliable water and good soil, so that they could plant um, maize, beans, and squash. Uh, they're still using fiber baskets. But they're doing the first experiments with this brown pottery. And because they are uh, picky about where they want to live and they still want to mill their seeds, they begin using a smaller and more portable uh, set of milling stones called metates. So let's look at projectile points. As we covered in a prior lesson, projectile points became smaller as a larger game began to disappear. So during the Basket Maker 2 era, we see the projectile points are about two-thirds the size of those of the Archaic era and roughly half the mass of the Folsom points of the Paleo-Indian era. The Atlat uh, is still being used as the main instrument uh, for hunting. Um, um, agriculture was doing for basket makers in New Mexico what um, what agriculture did for ancient man in the Middle East, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, in that it allows more time for a people who engage in agriculture to develop their culture and their art. So, um, this is a metate y mano. Mano means hand, as in this. That's because it's held, you hold a rock in your hand. It's, um, it's really a, a, a pestle. A pestle used on a flat rock called the metate that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you use it by uh, grasping it with two hands, uh, the mano that is, and you move it back and forth action to crack and break the, the maize into finer pieces we call corn flour. As shown in this photograph, the idea was to enclose the metate in a bin made of flat rocks. You knelt before it with uh, on your knees, and grasping the mano with two hands, you moved it back and forth on the rock, and ground it into fine flour. Of course, selecting all the the broken bits that aren't quite broken yet, you cast them back onto the rock, and you grind those until you get the whole batch ground finely. Now, this example that's shown here in a museum is over 700 years old, uh, at Mesa Verde. Remember, of course, that. We're talking about a time much older than, than what's found in this museum. At about uh, A.D. 500 and for about 250 years afterwards, some dramatic changes take place. White uh, ware pottery starts to appear with designs painted, um, uh, reflecting a maturing uh, psyche of the basket maker people. In addition, we see the appearance of the bow and arrow and maybe around A.D. 650, although that date is uncertain. Um, it becomes the hunting weapon, weapon of preference, but it will not completely replace the Atlat, just yet, anyway. The Atlat will continue its use uh, mostly for other purposes, but the bow and arrow, um, now by this time, basket maker, is the favored hunting weapon. And then we talk about also the pit houses. They get much deeper now. In the photograph, uh, this is a, a diorama, again, in a, the museum of, in Mesa Verde. We see that they are dug into the earth, and they're made of poles lashed together and chinked with mud. Uh, they made them uh, larger and, and secure enough to hold the weight of people walking on top, and they have a main entrance through a ladder that also serves as a chimney for the hearth or fireplace at the center on the floor. Uh, the people are now dependent on corn, beans, and squash. And so let's look at the three sisters. Yeah, you never thought of them as in this con concept, right? Uh, these crops are so important, they're called 
the three sisters. It's another way of expressing corn, beans, and squash. And here are uh, some 800-year-old seeds from a pueblo called Wutpatki, Wutpatki in today's state of Arizona. Now, just because domestic crops have um, um, the people who grow them eat better, um, and uh, people are now, as hunter-gatherers, living more securely by growing them, it, you have to consider that growing them also gave them more time to devote to their cultural development. Um, but it didn't mean that you just plant the seeds and then forget them. You can do that sometimes, but for the most part, you become a farmer. And as you know, farming requires you to stay in one place and settle down. You're now working for your plants, and you have to be attentive to them. And you have to keep them watered, and you have to keep them pest-free. So let me now introduce you to the Anasazi, the Mogollon, and the Hohokam, three ancient people in the southwest del norte that farmed the three sisters. So here they are. This is the range uh, of the three cultures of Anasazi, the Mogollon, and the Hohokam. You might now better be able to respatialize when you see this that the range of the Mogollon lays the premise by how, why we need to use the word El Norte in conjunction with talking about the American Southwest. The uh, Anasazi gave rise to the ancestral Puebloans and the Hohokam are thought to be related to the Mogollon but more specialized in lowland desert agriculture by diverting uh, water from streams. To the west, and uh, not shown on the map, were the Patayan living in this area right here. Uh, and they were farming or grew to farm the lowlands of the Rio Colorado uh, as well as they were hunter-gatherers. So by re-spatializing what I'm saying is that the present boundary of the U.S.-Mexico border and all the borders of uh, that are uh, uh, designate uh, political entities um, uh, do not apply when you start talking about the Mogollon whose culture... Uh, as a perceivable culture existed in people that were in this area from the Gila Cliff dwellings near Silver City, New Mexico to a set of ruins here in Chihuahua that I won't cover uh, just yet. So let's look at the design of the pit house. First, um, it's, it was used by the Cochise people. It was then used by their heirs, the Mogollon, Anasazi, and Hohokam. It's a dwelling where they first dug out the earth in a, a, a nice round hole and then they built a four post frame to hold the roof and then they leaned the, the poles on that frame let me point it out to you with my pen so here's one of the holding posts right here another one there's four of them and then they make a square uh, set of beams here like that then they lean these poles on them and then they put a, uh, a set of slats on them like lath over that and um, uh, here for example is the fire pit right here in the center so um, they these people had a predisposed talent for weaving baskets and so you can kind of perceive this uh, home to be a, an extension of their weaving craft they collected this, these straight sticks and bound them to the frame and often lashing them with um, with fiber uh, straps or maybe even with rawhide and uh, with the help of fibers maybe the dried grass or quipas of juniper bark they covered the frame uh, here and then covered it with mud so uh, notice also right here on the top this is the uh, the roof hatch it allows the smoke from the fire pit to escape but it's also the means by which to enter and exit the little house, the pit house. With all this talk of domestic crops uh, in pit houses, we need to address something important. Farming is not just being able to uh, grow something and eat now, but to have something to eat in the future and not live hand to mouth. This requires uh, planning out about uh, storage and the means to preserve what you've harvested and store your surplus somewhere where rodents don't eat it up for you. Now, filling pottery with seeds and sealing the top is one way. 
but I want to show you another way, such as depicted in this photo of a miniature museum display cut away so that you can see the inside. Okay, so the idea here is to dig a deep hole, maybe four to five feet deep. Um, you line it with rock and then quipas or juniper fiber here. You can even use, of course, um, things like uh, um, ears of, uh, of the corn uh, or the husk, shall we say. And then you neatly arrange your corn cobs here all in layers I'll stop right there and uh, seeds and other things like that in the inside the pit itself so uh, you seal it off on the top with uh, mud and soil like here and you have to consider that the ground keeps your food cool where a temperature of about 52 degrees is constant in the traditional Spanish language of New Mexico they use the word cuescomate cuescomate for this I learned that in uh, Morelos, Mexico, it's not uh, a pit in the ground. It's, uh, it's one of these. A cuescomate is an above-ground structure. Um, it's not a pit in the ground. So what they're doing is um, this elaborate above-ground structure, mud structure, is hollowed out on the bottom with a rock foundation and then roofed by sequential layers uh, of tied-up bunched grass. That are too slippery and awkward for rodents to get in it's the main entrance um, it has a main entrance up at the top so if you think about it right here this pit right here is a is a raised up above ground there's a layering of mud layering of grass one two three tied up in bunches that are slippery for the animals then there's this big hood and then it's um, it has an elaborate framework and right in here is how you reach the grain itself Isn't that interesting um, so you climb up through a ladder to the top of the hooded roof of grass and there you can extract the grain and in the meantime you're keeping it dry and pest free. Archaeological evidence suggests that the uh, bow and, and arrow now become the favored hunting and warfare weapon during the Basket Maker III era. Originating in the Arctic regions around 1600 BC it reached the Great Basin, um, well, what, around uh, AD 500, and it becomes the most favored way to kill birds, animals bigger than a rabbit, all the way to the size of an elk. To make the bow, uh, juniper oak, um, uh, elderberry lemita, or better yet, uh, Osage orange wood could be attained through trade because it didn't grow here in New Mexico very much. So juniper, Oak, elderberry, and lemita were favored. Um, and you would split it, and then you would shape it into a leaf spring, which is essentially what a bow is. It's a leaf spring. When you find reeds uh, and bush stems for arrow shafts, you find seldom find them growing perfectly straight. But by heating them up uh, with a specially shaped uh, ball of clay or rock on the hot embers of a campfire, you just throw it on, heat it up, uh, you can use it to, to straighten the shafts. You get some water on your fingers and you wipe the shaft and make it wet. And then you get the shaft and you draw the shaft through that channel in this uh, stone, in this arrow straightener. And then you gently, with the finger pressure, hand pressure, gently bend the arrow shaft straight. There's other things to do like arrowheads, uh, which involve a lot of uh, knowledge of how to uh, chip, find the, the correct type of... Uh, a stone, which is, could be obsidian, chert, flint, uh, chip them, shape them. You have to uh, tie them on with uh, little st um, straps of, uh, of sinew, which come from a deer. It's those white pieces, like in beef jerky, that's, that peel off, but longer versions of that, uh, like the tendons of the legs and so forth. And uh, you also use that as your string to tie on the arrow feathers. So you have to find feathers cut them to shape using stone uh, bladed web um, instruments and then mount them onto the shaft uh, in little little grooves that you put into the shaft and then you have to string the bow with some fiber like from yaka or palmia uh, or even the sinew of deer 
I want to introduce you to an ancient people who lived in today's Utah, practicing what is known as the Fremont culture. Uh, they lived in pit houses and they practiced what is known uh, uh, as a culture of pit houses, uh, all the way from uh, 300 AD to 1300 AD, when climate changed seriously and changed the demographics of the southwest El Norte region. While they were, thri they were thriving, however, they were known for maintaining a lifestyle that elsewhere to the south evolved into the Pueblo culture of the Anasazi. The Fremont were known for their pit house villages and life in the rugged canyonlands. They moved from place to place according to the season, and they left behind some extraordinary rock art of, the, of these wide-shouldered uh, figures, human figures, believed to be shaman, as well as other humanoid figures, lots of animals, and strange symbols. Uh, so, as we draw to a conclusion, I want you to know uh, why are the basket makers, uh, the basket maker people, why are they called basket makers? The answer is because they were into the fiber arts, among which was the weaving of um, household goods like baskets. Do you know what a matate is? A metate is a stone that was developed to grind uh, seeds and grain and turn especially corn into corn flour. And then you have uh, pit houses. Uh, uh, what are they? They are dwellings dug out of the earth and covered by roofs of mud and, of course, poles and other things that you just saw. Descendants of Paleolithic migrants to the Americas uh, adapted their culture to this changing climate which became warmer and then drier. And then you have the archaic era people that appeared in the American Southwest El Norte Mexicano. Uh, and you had the Cochise people. You had uh, wild foods and famine foods of our subregion of New Mexico that fed the early people of Southwest El Norte region. So make sure you know what a famine food is. It's those foods that uh, you rely on when your favorite foodstuffs are not available. And then uh, let's um, look at uh, wild uh, or domestic plants such as the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash. And yeah, I can, you can use corn. Corn, beans, and squash rather than maize. And uh, others' foodstuffs uh, arrived and improved the lives of the hunter-gatherers, leading them to settle down, which then subsequently led to advancements in their culture and their art. Now, you learned also how the hunter-gatherers of the southwest El Norte region evolved into three eras. The early basket makers of the archaic era, the basket maker two and the basket maker three eras, were where cultural advancements uh, included such things as domestic crops with higher yields, the bow and arrow, pottery, and this semi-permanent life in villages and pit houses. So... This concludes the lecture on the basket maker time periods.